Good afternoon, Europe, and welcome to this very first block of keynotes of the BEST Virtual Summit 2020. Today we have with us a very special guest, the woman who's leading one of the best universities in the world. Today we have with us Sarah Springman, which is the current rector of ATH Zurich, a college that has been ranked as the number one university in continental Europe and the fourth in the world in engineering and technology, according to QS World Ranking. So Sarah started she studied engineering science at Cambridge University, and she holds a PhD in soil mechanics. But Sara is also an has an also interesting sporting career, as she has won 20 championship medals in a triathlon and duathlon. Sara is, in a few words, a role model for women in STEM, and the kind of rector you would love to have in the university as she hosts question rounds on Instagram. So today, Sara is going to talk about challenges and opportunities in future education, empathize, empathizing the importance of adding value to education in general, and illustrating this through examples of innovation in ATH theory. Said so, welcome Sara to this opening keynote. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Daniel, for that very kind uh, introduction. And I'm now going to try and share my screen with you and see whether or not, oops, I've gone onto the wrong slide already. There we go, never trust a rector with the slides. And I think I now need to switch it over. Hopefully, is that the right slide now? Are you, am, I, am I in the right way? Very good, okay. So um, I'm really delighted to be here. I have to say simply the best is fantastic. Great honor to come and talk to you. And I want to share with you our challenge in Switzerland, which is not only are we quite good in the world rankings, but also, we don't have mineral resources, we simply have brains. And brains are what we do, and these are what we do very well. And that is really the biggest resource that we have. So just to give you a few stats, I'm not gonna read them out, but really quite a high percentage of doctoral students as a percentage of our overall number of students, just over 500 professors. And we really, really focus on entrepreneurial activity as well, so over, 400 spin-offs in the last 20 plus years. So how do I explain this to you? I think there is an added value of education. I always talk about what happens when people come to us at the beginning of their BSc and what happens when they lead at, leave at the end of their MSc or their doctorate or even when they come back for continuing education. Because what we do is the delta in terms of knowledge, in terms of skills and in terms, terms of the development of the personality. And clearly we have to build on the knowledge that our students have when they come. We build a very solid fundamental basis with mathematics and now a growing amount of, uh, of uh, computer science and engineering. Our natural sciences and mechanics are essential. And then basically subject specific knowledge that enables somebody to say, I have a degree in mine was civil engineering, mechanical engineering, environmental science, or whatever. And in so doing, one develops skills and competencies along the way, but also rather like the young people hosting this conference today, you develop your personality, you work in teams, you learn how to present, you learn how to lead people. And this is setting you up for the workplace um, in of the future and I think it's really important. I talk a lot about doing the right things. Do you have an evolutionary strategy with a culture of enablement um, that allows people then to develop the education and to develop themselves all the way through? And one of the things we need to do to check whether or not people have developed is to assess them. And I think it's very important today to recognize that how you assess people will affect the way in which they learn. And therefore you need to have authentic examinations. And uh, I think we're seeing in the future very much that our professors are changing from the so-called sage on the stage to the guide on the side, really encourages active learning so that all of this doesn't just go in one side and come out the other. This sort of stays there and is very much um, able to be used. So we want to innovate in teaching and learning so that there is a continuous dialogue in terms of education. And I think that means that we have to look at not just knowledge and skills, but also very much bringing the attitudes so that we place what we're learning at different stages, maybe early on, 
on knowledge and developing the skills a bit more and also the attitudes perhaps later on. So I think that's quite important to talk about. And our university has very much engaged in uh, critical thinking to help our students to work independently in interdisciplinary and in intercultural teams. Because after all, what are you going to be doing when you first graduate? You'll be precisely in that, uh, in that environment and you need to be able to communicate. And if I say several languages, I don't necessarily mean linguistically, but technical languages to be able to interact with different um, interest groups and to instill intellectual uh, ability and critical thinking in a very responsible approach to the way our graduates take action in their future um, working life. So to have the ability to analyze and reflect on complex problems, and the ability to develop an original uh, stance and to defend it, and being able to communicate clearly and behave responsibly in science. And one of the top things that I've been able to do in my time as rector is to lead beyond study programs, the development of extracurricular opportunities with this making and breaking, I would like to say, showing and connecting and also basically um, uh, just sharing that outside. And I think we will have a, a two student project. I think we have a pilot one at the moment. Um, and this is the one that will be open next year, by the way. Uh, our university, and this is precisely where I am at the moment, in this window just here, you see my arrow there. Um, and I think this is really, really important. It's part of our critical thinking initiative, so our students can go away and have an idea and then construct it themselves. And this is a lovely example of in the time of Corona, when our students, despite the lockdown, were able to go in with appropriate hygiene and social facing, uh, uh, social distancing rules, and they designed and built uh, with the 3D printers and so on, things like face shields for use in the hospital or a device to protect and um, look after a, a mobile phone from the doctor who's going into a, a COVID um, ward. And just nice examples, they also created the Poly, we known as the Poly Polytechnica from years ago, the Poly vent, a ventilator that has been constructed here also and is being used for a nations, third world nations that can't afford to design their own. So lots of useful things um, like that. And again, we've been engaging now in, in project-based teaching. This is a, a very interesting um, challenge. The students face in the second semester in mechanical engineering. You can see a team um, here. There is actually a woman there, I know. Uh, teams of about anything from four to six. And the idea was they had to create a device that could go up here, a uh, mechatronics device to take people, save people or, um, or radioactive materials from this building um, in a three minute time slot. And you can see one of the devices here. They built it themselves and they went under the competition, competition environment to do it. And it worked really very well indeed. And on top of that, again, had to be assessed. Here you can see online examinations that allow us to ask questions that are authentic. For example, in uh, computer science, how do you program? And you give somebody a question and then they just have to sit down and they program. And that is a very good way of assessing whether or not they've been able to, to learn it. And this is really, really important, I think, for the future. We are seeing that now about 30% uh, percent of our exams are online. Uh, that will grow to well over the 50%, I think. And we've been a, a global pioneer in setting up and hosting online examinations. We have the same exam browser that we share across the world. Um, and essentially, it's quite useful as well for uh, foreign students who cannot be in Zurich uh, at the same time. So all sorts of things going on there. And we have a strict peculiarity as well. In addition to our written exams, we do oral exams, which some of the Anglo-Saxon world hasn't really uh, come across um, before. So I think also one of the things that's very important is preparing our graduates for the future to be recruited, to be developed, to be retained, and also to engage in lifelong learning. I can promise you, as rector, when I walked into this office uh, nearly six and a half years ago, I was uh, very raw and I have learned so much every day 
in this role. And I think it's really important that all of you realize that your bachelor, your master, or your doctorate have just opened the door on learning um, for the rest of your life. And I think there are also the soft skills um, that are exceptionally important that I think we should start to train a little bit during the time at university. So we've been working a little bit on that with an ETA talent portfolio that is going to be ready in about a year's time. So now I promised I was going to share something about uh, teaching and learning in the time of, of Corona. And just to summarize, we were, we announced we were going online uh, a day ahead of our Bundesrat, so the, the federal council. Um, and we were way ahead of all of the other universities except for our sister school at EPFL. We talked with each other and we did it basically together. It worked incredibly well. We had educational um, advisors and specialists in our departments who helped to support everybody with Zoom. Uh, and it was enormous credit to all of our people that we flipped within 83 hours from the moment of announcement to eight o'clock on Monday morning and they were online and it really, really worked. And most of our students appreciated, you could see a survey after three weeks here, a thousand students said, yes, thumbs up, 17 were not so happy, but I think I can cope with that. And I was really very pleased with these results and we shared the ideas for improvement with our colleagues as well. Um, one thing that was really a secret was to update our educational regulations. So we removed some of the limiting um, aspects of our, our examinations. We maintained the quality at the same level and we published in three versions as we developed our ideas so that it was additive. So we knew we were always going in the same direction. And we had some of our students who were serving in the military and in hospital, and we offered special conditions to support them because they were doing something that was really important. And the last point in this slide I want to say was communication was absolutely essential. We had our website, we had focused emails, videos, frequently asked questions, Twitter. Um, Daniel mentioned my Instagram live chats. The first one I had about 1500 people uh, joining in with that. I have to say I got rather more boring since then, but I think I've probably done about eight or so. Uh, and still have about 250 and then something like 5,000 watch the uh, broadcast afterwards. We had town halls and we developed our ideas in discussion with the directors of studies, the executive board, the student presidents, um, before we then communicated with all students and, and lecturers. And I think one of the things that's really important is to think about how do you and how do students learn? And I think there will be a lot of developments after uh, after this experience. And I think we will change the way in which we teach to try and help you all to learn even better. What can be done better? One of the things that I think is very important is that the social networks around learning are something that really need to have a certain amount more attention played to them because people learn better and are more successful if they have an effective social network, which of course under lockdown conditions has been a little bit more uh, challenged. Now, unfortunately, I just rushed into, I changed my presentation to add an extra slide because I received this over the weekend. This is the feedback from the lecturers and the students gave me 41% feedback. I have to say our lecturers gave us 61%. And what they basically said was, it's difficult to do laboratory practicals, that's the red bit here. Um, in, in the group works, that was pretty good. Um, when the uh, lecturers were, uh, were, were presented with Zoom, for example, that worked really well. There's very little uh, red or pink on this side. Likewise, live streaming was very popular from the side of the lecturers. They felt it worked well. Um, if they did all of this in an empty uh, lecture hall. So people, the mathematicians love writing in chalk um, on, the, on the blackboard. Uh, and then that was just another uh, way of doing it. So they were generally very positive. And I think my final point was that when you are in a situation like this, students are put in a very difficult situation. They can't work, they have to stay at home. So we, um, we had a campaign 
we raise the temporary loans, which are basically interest-free loans and the time to repay them. That number actually, I think, is now up to close to 40. Um, we have social scholarships that we support for those who, who struggle. Some of them said to me, my parents have lost, lost their job. I don't know how I'm going to survive. We will help them. This is really very important. We increased our advisory services to support um, home working uh, and also our, our psychological advisory service. And we tried to resolve issues for our mobility students. So all of this was really important. The networks, networks, networks were really um, absolutely essential. So um, this is my last uh, slide. Uh, never waste a good crisis. Make sure um, that you learn something from it, that you, each one of you, have a look at yourselves and work out what went well, uh, what could I have done better, because I do exactly the same thing all the time. If this was to happen tomorrow, what would I do? And all of this is now flowing into how we will run the examinations in August and also how we will run uh, the autumn semester coming up this year. So I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me and uh, hand back now to uh, Daniel, maybe to take a few questions if anybody's out there at all and wants to ask anything. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Sara, so much for the whole presentation. Um, I would like to apologize uh, to the audience because at the beginning we had a little lag and with the sound, but we managed to fix it in the end. So everything is all right right now. Um, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. It's actually super interesting. I think many of our viewers will now start like looking how to apply to to, to Jeju University. Um, actually, uh, some of them already left some some questions. Um, I would like to share it with you. Um, the first one it says, "What can be the role of universities in fighting a global crisis such as the pandemic?" This is a really important one. I've just focused a little bit on on education. But I think the research and the role of the academic expert is absolutely essential. Many governments are led today by um, rather extreme leaders who don't want to listen to, to science. And I think the university's role is to make sure that they are heard uh, at the center of government so that when government is taking decisions, they take it in the um, knowledge of what the latest science is saying. Obviously, all we can do is advise and say, this is what the science says. One side might say this, one side might say that. Our recommendation as a group of experts is, this is the right uh, uh, scientific background that you as politicians have to make the policy decisions. And I think this is really important. So we've been advising um, on what's been happening to the genome of the uh, COVID virus, uh, what's happening in terms of uh, the growth of the R number, uh, whether we're going to get a second wave, and all sorts of different people are working on drug discovery and design as well. So we had a call and we had about 30 projects actually that we have permitted and funded to start in order to help us fight um, the virus. So I think relationship between politics and the university is really, really important. All right, definitely. So Super interesting point. Uh, politician needs science. Probably science will give a better response to some policy advices. We have a second question um, for you, Sara. And this says as follows. It's, it's anonymous, but it says, uh, how can students support their universities after the pandemic? Okay, well, we had absolutely wonderful examples and that we're not the only university. Our students came up and said, we've just, uh, we're in the middle of our Bachelor of Medicine. We want to serve, we want to help. So how can we do this? And so I uh, approved them to work for 50% um, within the hospitals, provided all of the health and safety aspects were, um, were uh, covered and they had to register and they organized it themselves. They placed uh, where the students should go. Uh, and some of them went to the, uh, our university um, hospital, which is across the way, but others, went into the counties that don't have any university hospitals. So they did a fantastic job. Self-organization of students works when you've got really, really good students. So again, uh, designing these ventilators, um, there are lots of things going on. And I think uh, you just think, you look and you see where there is a gap, where you have a skill that you can share 
maybe you're sitting in a lab analyzing um, COVID samples, you know, whatever, because you've had some lab training. And those things are really very important. And I, I really believe that our students today are generally absolutely fantastic and can make a great uh, contribution. Okay, that's very interesting, Sarah. Um, we have another question for you. Uh, maybe it's a little more specific, but it says, how can labs and other hands-on activities can be adapted to remote teaching? Oh, sorry, can you say that again? How can, yeah, so how can labs and other hands-on activities can be adapted to remote okay. teaching? Yeah, okay, very, very good question. This was the one that was the least satisfactory um, for our lectures and I think for the students, because basically we want to go into the lab and find out that you know, when you plug in your, 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 your apparatus, it doesn't work, what do you do to solve the problem? However, if you have data from a previous year, then you can um, present that. If you have a virtual lab, so again, you can use the virtual lab and sometimes the virtual lab will give you data. So even around about 2000, I had, uh, as a soil mechanics person, I used to do a sieve test and you had a stack of sieves and you put soil in the top I would shake, you would shake the sieve and then you would get weights on each of the sieves, you would weigh it. And then at the end of the day, you would produce a particle size distribution and tell me that this was a, um, a sandy gravel uh, with some large stones in it or whatever. And then we would talk about what that meant. So if you have a virtual lab, you can combine that. And it may well be that there is a window of opportunity, maybe after the semester is over and where you're back again in the labs, People can go in and do three or four labs to add that practical experience uh, to what one has done um, online. So again, um, scenarios, sets of data, and, and other creative ways of, uh, of, of approximating the lab. But it, it's not entirely satisfactory, but you don't have to lose the whole of the lab. Okay, per perfect, Sarah. That's a, actually a very interesting answer. Um, I have, a last question for you, as we are going to be finalizing this uh, super interesting keynote in two minutes. So the last question is, what are the advantages of online lectures and how they can adapt, like, which are like the advantages of online education as opposed to regular education or in person education? Two things. First of all, you can use media and you can use educational apps that allow you to interact um, with your students if your students are really um, very shy. So we find our students respond in the chat much more than they do in class. I remember asking questions and my students' heads would go like this, which made me realize, oh dear, they don't want to interact with me. But when you're online and you don't see their face, they will type a question into the chat. That's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing is that if you save the lecture, if you've been one of those people who's been in the military or in the hospitals or whatever, you can look at it later and you can move it faster or slower or go back and really try and understand and learn something. So I think this is a real benefit um, that will certainly help students to be able to learn in the way they want to learn in the future. All right, Sarah, so more participation and more tailored to like the rhythm of the students. Um, okay, that's... I guess one of the best like answers we have tilted right now. So let's so with this question, Sarah, we're gonna to conclude this keynote about the future of education or education in ETH Zurich. The organizing team and I would like to publicly thank you for being here as today and to sharing the knowledge and your ideas in the best virtual summit 2020. Although Sarah and I will leave, I will encourage all of you to stay close to the streaming as in five minutes, another key speaker will be with us. We'll travel through from Zurich to Paris to be Noah, one of the project officers of UNESCO's Future of Education Initiative. As you know, United Nations is the, the UNESCO is the United Nations scientific and cultural organization. So guys, stay there. This is going to be really, really interesting. Stay tuned and see you. Thank bye you, bye. Daniel. Thank you, all of you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Sarah.